Hey, my name is Forrest, welcome back. So there are three types of algorithms you should know as a programmer. We actually go over nine algorithms in this video, what they are, how they work, real world use cases, complete with code examples and explanations, but they fall under three categories three types of algorithms you should know. Sorting algorithms, used to rearrange elements in a list or an array in a certain order. Searching algorithms, used to find or retrieve an element from a data structure or to determine its existence and location in the data set. And graph algorithms, used to solve problems related to graph theory, where data is represented as a collection of nodes or vertices connected by edges. You probably know these as trees. And just as I did in my four data structures video, I wanna say I'm proud of you for clicking on this video because this isn't the glitz and glamor where you can watch this video and dream about being a software engineer Engineer. This is the getting into the nitty gritty, the stuff that you do that'll actually make you a software engineer. So why are these algorithms you should know? Because they form the foundation of efficient problem solving in computer science. Studying these not only enhances programming skills, but deepens analytical thinking. And they're instrumental in optimizing software performance among a wide array of real world applications. It's like the difference between building something with a hammer versus a nail gun. And this is a quick analogy, I promise. They both get the job done, but the nail gun is clearly more efficient for most projects. But but sometimes the hammer would actually be a better choice because it could be more efficient due to the scope of the task. Same with algorithms. Some may be better for most tasks, but not all tasks. And you need to know these different algorithms exist to know which one to use. Because if you never knew a nail gun existed, well, good luck trying to frame your entire house using just a hammer. It may take you a while. So sorting algorithms. A sorting algorithm is a method or process used to rearrange elements in a list or an array in a certain order, whether it be ascending, descending, or even based on some complex rules. The purpose of sorting is to organize data in a way that makes it easier to use, easier to search, analyze, and display information efficiently. If you wanted another analogy, it's like if you take a shuffled deck of cards and you want to put it in order. Here are actually eight different sorting algorithms working on four different initial conditions, random, nearly sorted, reversed, and few unique. It's a beautiful representation of how these these algorithms are great at sorting some initial conditions, but bad at sorting others. But I want to break it down even further. Let's take a look at bubble sort, helping programmers learn how not to sort things since the 1950s, but a great representation of showing how sorting algorithms work. Bubble sort is a simple sorting algorithm that repeatedly steps through the array element by element, comparing the current element with the one after it, swapping their values that the former is larger than the latter, repeating again and again until the array is finally sorted. The code works as such. First, it determines the length of the array. The outer for loop represents each iteration through the entire array, but along the way, the inner for loop iterates over the unsorted part of the array, where the if statement compares adjacent elements, bubbling the larger elements all the way to the top. That's the infamous bubble sort. It has an average and worst case time complexity of big O squared, which means it's not a very good choice for sorting things. Insertion sort, however, is a little bit better most of the time. Insertion sort is a simple sorting algorithm, again, that builds the final sorted array one element at a time. The code works as such. The for loop sequentially selects each element of the array, starting at index one, which is the second element in the array. For each selected element, which is key, the while loop compares it with the elements in the sorted section of the array, so all the elements before the current position. While key is smaller than the sorted elements, those sorted elements are shifted to the right to make space until the correct position for key is found, where it is then inserted. This process process repeats until each element has been correctly placed, resulting in a sorted array. Like bubble sort, it does have an average and worst case time complexity of big O squared. However, its best case time complexity is big O, making it a fine choice in situations where the data set is nearly sorted, but a poor choice when the data set is reversed. Now that we've seen some not so great yet simple and good representations of sorting algorithms, let's take a look at one of the more efficient sorting algorithms, merge sort. Merge sort is an efficient, stable, and comparison-based divide and conquer sorting algorithm, and it's recursive. It divides the input array into two halves, calls itself for the two halves, recursion, sorting them, and then merges the two sorted halves. The code works as such. The merge sort function checks if the array has more than one element since a single element is already sorted. It then splits the array into two halves. Recursively, the function is called for each half. Once these halves are sorted, the merge function then takes these two sorted halves and merges them into a single sorted array. This merging is done by comparing the elements of both halves one by one and placing the smaller element into the new array, continuing this process until all elements are sorted and merged. Merge sort has a time complexity of big O of n log n in all cases. However, it requires additional space for those temporary arrays used during the merge process, which can be an issue in memory constrained environments. Whereas an algorithm like quicksort, which is almost or oftentimes equally as good as merge sort, is an in-place sort, which requires very little memory. 
And there are many more sorting algorithms like selection sort, shell sort, heap sort, and so on. The sorting algorithm you use depends on your use case, system capabilities, and the specific characteristics of the data you're dealing with, like size or whether or not it's partially sorted already. Sorting algorithms are fundamental in computer science and are used in many real world applications, from organizing files on a computer to arranging database records for easy retrieval. Now, I don't have any actual sponsors for this video, but if you ever wish to support the channel, there are three things that you could do if you find them beneficial to yourself. One is subscribe to the channel. Two is subscribe to my free software engineering newsletter, DevNotes, at devnotesdaily.com. Or three, if you're a student, consider purchasing Studious for Notion at notionstudent.com. Now, searching algorithms. A searching algorithm is a method or process used to find or retrieve an element from a data structure. The goal is to find whether an item exists in the data set and oftentimes to determine its location. It's akin to opening the yellow pages to look for a specific phone number. But you have to do it thousands of times, so you better make sure your searching algorithm is correct. You know how much I love these real analogies. <laughs> One way to do it is via a sequential search algorithm like linear search, which is exactly what it sounds like. Each element is checked in sequence until you find what you're looking for or the list ends. And if the current element equals what we're looking for, which is X, return it. The average and worst case time complexity is big O of N, where N is the number of elements in the array. So in other words, if the element is found in the first index, well, then this is a pretty good so uh, searching algorithm to use. But if it's the last index, Maybe not so much. An interval search like binary search would be a more efficient approach, assuming that this is a sorted data set. It works by dividing the search interval in half repeatedly. So if we wanted to use that analogy of the yellow pages in this example, which is alphabetical order, so already sorted, it would be like opening the book directly in half. And based on the name, let's say it starts with a T, well, you eliminate the first half, then you take the second half, split that one in half, check the middle element there, and then see which side of that middle element that it's on, eliminate that half, so on and so forth, until you find that element or it's not in the list. The code works as such. You start by passing in the sorted array and the element you're looking for into the binary search function. Initialize the left and right boundaries to represent the current search interval. The while loop accesses the middle of the current search interval, compares the middle element of the array with the target value, and if they are not equal, eliminates the half of the array that doesn't contain the target. It then repeats this process on the remaining half until you find the target or the array can't be divided any further, meaning the target isn't there. The time complexity of binary search is big O of log n, in the worst and average cases, making it significantly faster than linear search for sorted arrays. And of course, there are many other searching algorithms like jump or exponential or Fibonacci, or you could just use a hash table search and just look up the key in the hash table with the big O of one time complexity. But you know, that's not always the case. So we gotta actually discuss these other ones because searches utilize in tasks such as querying databases or searching for something in your files. I'm pointing to my computer here, by the way, and many other applications where quick retrieval is crucial. Graph algorithms are another type of algorithm you should know. Graph algorithms are a set of instructions used to solve problems related to graph theory, where data is represented as a collection of nodes connected by edges like trees. Graph algorithms are pretty dang crucial for handling and analyzing relationships between elements, which are used in numerous real world applications like computer networks, social networks, and literal roadmaps. You know how you type in an address in maps and get directions, or maybe you you know type it into MapQuest and print it out if you're living in 2005? Well, this is an example of a graph algorithm at work. Remember, the data you use graph algorithms on is a collection of nodes connected by edges. You get to get the nodes as intersections and the edges as roads. A rather inefficient way to go about this would be to utilize DFS, or depth-first search, which I have quite a bit of experience with. But depth-first search is exactly what it sounds like. You go as deep as possible in a single way, see if it works, then backtrack if it doesn't. So it basically just keeps trying different routes at each intersection to see if it gets to where you need to go. Checking every possible turn and road to reach your destination. Not exactly the best way to go about it, but, but it's recursive. Yes, it's recursive. You can see how it works in the code here. The DFS function gets past the graph it needs to traverse, its starting node, and nodes that it has already visited. During each recursive call, the function marks the current node as visited, then iteratively explores each of the node's unvisited neighbors. And if a neighbor is not visited, this process continues until all reachable nodes from the starting point have been visited. And I would discuss the time complexity of DFS here, but it really depends on how you go about it. If the graph is represented using adjacency lists, then this is a time complexity. But if the graph is represented using an adjacency matrix, this is a time complexity. However, we could talk about space complexity, whereas most of the time, DFS will have a big O of V space complexity, which V stands for vertices, otherwise known as nodes. They're 
interchangeable. Now, when talking about DFS, you always got to talk about BFS, breadth first search, which again is exactly how it sounds. Breadth first. So expanding wide simultaneously instead of singular depth like DFS. BFS is a layer by layer approach, casting a wide net from your starting point and gradually widening it. So basically, if you're standing in the middle of an intersection with four options or four roads, you take all four of those roads to their next intersection one at a time. That's the first layer. And if you aren't at your final destination at any of these intersections or again, nodes, then you start the next layer by checking all remaining roads or edges at each one of those intersections. You are now at 12 nodes simultaneously and checking all edges from there to the next nodes until you find your destination. That's all this is. It's like your kids in the back seat. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? We will turn this van around, mister. He started it. But instead, it's you asking yourself that at each layer. And because BFS keeps track of the paths taken, you're now able to trace back the route taken, which will be the shortest path, but only in terms of layers traversed. Yeah, again, not the best way to go about it. It has the same space and time complexity of DFS as well. Instead, we'll use Dijkstra's algorithm. This is quite literally the algorithm that Google Maps uses, or at least a modified and enhanced version of Dijkstra's algorithm, which is a star algorithm. And then they also modify and advance that algorithm in order to get their proprietary thing that works way better than Apple Maps all the time. We can talk about both. Dijkstra's algorithm finds the shortest path between a given node, which is called the source node, and all other nodes in a graph. But not only that, it also uses the weights of the edges, again, roads, to find the path that minimizes the total weight, or distance, between the source node and all other nodes. So in short, it takes into account the distance and cost of each road, which is akin to considering factors like road length, traffic conditions, and speed limits to determine the quickest route. This is the only algorithm of these three that's actually thinking ahead, recalculating the best route as you move from node to node. And of course, A star. I had to talk about it. A star is a graph traversal and pathfinding algorithm used in many fields of computer science due to its completeness, optimality, and optimal efficiency. Like Dijkstra's algorithm, A star is a sophisticated algorithm used to find the shortest path between point A and point B. It's broadly the same thing, except it uses a heuristic function giving priority priority to nodes that are supposed to be better than the others. So estimating the cost from the current node all the way to the destination at every node, prioritizing nodes that are believed to be closer to the goal, making it more efficient. Dijkstra's algorithm does not have this heuristic. And there are so many more algorithms I want to discuss, like dynamic programming using the Fibonacci sequence or the knapsack problem. Hint, hint. Dynamic programming, by the way, is just breaking down problems into smaller subproblems but also hashing algorithms to efficiently map data of any size to data of a fixed size. That is a fun one and so many more. So if you want to see more, you want me to do that, just let me know. I love this stuff. I'd make nothing but these videos if I could. So just if you do like it, make sure you subscribe. Again, leave a comment to let me know and turn on the bell notification so you get notified when I upload my next algorithm video. Again, I'm Forrest. I'll see you in the next one.